which is the natural progression, but at the same time, I feel like people kind of miss the, the in-between stage. So you can say. Yeah, so, so I'm not totally lying. But a the lot of secrets times, come out <laughs> ten years later. <laughs> like we're, hopefully your parents are watching this. Yeah, we're yeah. safe. Three, two, one. Welcome back to the Sandbar with your friendly neighborhood MC Sandy Paulino, and I'm joined today by Carol and Cami. Tell us a little bit about yourselves. Hi, hi. Uh, so my name is Cami. I am a social worker based in Philadelphia. Um, pronouns are she, they. And yeah, I'm just a proud social worker and happy to be here. Hi everyone, um, I am Carol. I graduated from the University of Pennsylvania with a psychology degree. I am currently an admissions officer at an Ivy League institution and I primarily work in equity and access work. Good stuff, good stuff. A lot of connection I made before this started was that you guys are really into kind of helping lead the younger generation, getting them into the opportunities that um, aren't necessarily presented to them by the general public. But yeah, Cami. so you're a social worker, right? Yes. Like uh, I mentioned, I don't really know much about social work. I know what they show on TV, and I, you know, yeah. like I know the general th- stuff, but right. take us I, through like a, sure. a regular day. Sure, I mean, it, it varies. Social work is a very general um, type of career. So I think when people think social work, they're like, oh, my God, you're going to take my kids away um, <laughs> yeah, or something yeah. like that. And that's just not I mean, that can be the case, um, mm-hmm. but there's it, it varies a lot. It could um, go into like case management. Um, there's actually social workers. If you have clinical license, you can be a therapist as a social worker. So it's really you can do policy work. Um, it varies a lot um, for me specifically. Like I have um, an undergraduate degree in psychology. Um, and then I majored in social work um, for my master's. And so basically, for me, my focus in my master's, because you kind of have to choose a lane between like micro or macro. And I chose macro because I, for me, organizational development, um, power dynamics related to race um, and gender and all of those mm. things uh, for me are really important. And I just believe, you know, policy is kind of where you really make the big change. Yeah. And so for me, that's kind of the route that I kind of want to take okay. for the future. Um, but yeah, social work is very is very broad. You yeah, can do a yeah. lot of different things um, with it. But currently I am working um, in the human services field. I work for a home care agency and I do kind of care management for my okay. clients. Yeah. Yeah, okay, what Carol, what there. about equity and access? Uh, so right now I am, so I originally didn't know what I wanted to do when I graduated. So I did psychology with a minor in gender, sexuality, and women's studies, and that was something that I was really passionate about. Mm. Um, uh, then I graduated and went into kind of housing and residential life because I was an RA in undergrad. And after that, I realized I really wanted to travel, Mm -hmm. but I really also wanted to make a difference. And so I felt like being an admissions officer, um, you might think it might be like a gatekeeping type of situation, Mm -hmm. but actually it's an opportunity to to really give those opportunities to the kids that really deserve it. Um, At an Ivy League institution, sometimes you... um, you know, um, <laughs> you kind of say no a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah. It's like a really small percent rate. Um, but I really love getting to know different students, um, their stories, what they what they love to do and how and who they want to be. And ultimately to be able to say yes to students who are amazing just in doing so many great things is really exciting to me. Um, and I really wanted to make a difference because education, I feel like now – is it so you have high schools that have a lot of opportunities like mm. AP classes or um, dual enrollment and then there's some schools that don't have any of that at all yeah and so to be able to say yes to a public school kid in the inner city is so amazing mm. as opposed to some students who have had everything handed to them yeah. so I know I'm not making the most difference that I can right now as an admissions officer I would love to eventually get on the counseling side or the policy side to really make change but you gotta start somewhere exactly yeah, yeah. and that's that's crazy that you say that last part about doing enrollment in AP because I come from a public school that has that yeah or had that when I was in high school and when I got into college it was kind of like this crazy shock that not everybody knew about doing enrollment exactly. you know like I got into college and I was kind of already halfway done with my freshman year and some of these people like they didn't have for I have my issues with AP classes because I feel like it's a little bit of a scam but yeah. um doing enrollment yeah. is very like 
eye opening for a high school junior senior to be able to get that college experience mm -hmm. before they get into college is was huge for me. So I think having that mindset of kind of like understanding that not every school provides that to their students is is pretty crazy exactly and me and my sister went bo both to the same high school so she graduated a year earlier than i did and my year was when they first got the ap courses oh, wow. so i was able to graduate yeah. with three of them i and that's one of the reasons why i applied to a place like penn i was like yeah. oh i got my ap's in i can mm -hmm. i can do this you already know yeah exactly yeah. and she didn't have that opportunity no i had no idea <laughs> I, I didn't do any of that yeah um, i yeah. kind of just went in blind and you know dive yeah. deep yeah. into it um but yeah. yeah. When I was in high school, too, a lot of what I thought about was I was a little bit competitive, so I mm. wanted to be the best in the class. Um, I didn't want to be that competitive. I wasn't trying to be valedictorian, but I loved <laughs> to be at least yeah. like, you know, in you the wanted top. to kind of like comfortably win. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm like, I know that I could be the best, but I'm not trying to yeah. be the best. I'm I mean, I led the way because I was also like top five in my class. Oh, so it's not okay. like, you know, <laughs> no, first of all, it's no flag, I was an no athlete, flag, too. Yeah. I was an athlete, too. <laughs> so was <laughs> I. Where, oh, you did volleyball. You're right. Yes. Yeah. What do you, she's just completely forget. I, excuse I'm me. Sorry. I am the blueprint and you kind of okay. anyway after. what I was yeah. trying to so. say what I was trying to um <laughs> I took the AP classes because I wanted to be a little bit competitive there was only one other girl mm. that took the other AP class um so there was three of them I took two the other girl took three and then there was also dual enrollment mm -hmm. and that um I wasn't really rich when I was in high school yeah, I didn't yeah. have a lot of money and so you have to pay for dual enrollment too yeah and that's something that I didn't want to do and so now as an admissions officer, I think about that when I'm admitting those kids. Mm. I understand why students are taking dual enrollment as opposed to taking AP classes. And the AP classes, you also have to pay like ninety dollars yeah. in order to take the test. And if you don't do well, then it's they don't nothing. take you exactly, yeah. or you don't get credit. So it's yeah. frustrating. When I heard that, um, the first time I took dual enrollment, I got help paying. That's the only reason I was able to. I got help with the payment. But um, the when I did the class, I was like, wow, this is just. The other thing is that my first class was a history class. So it's kind of, you know, straightforward, whatever. The second one was English, and I, English was kind of our reading and writing was pretty pretty much my strong suit and, mm -hmm. like, going up through middle school and high school. But I would listen to these kids complain about their AP class that's, like, exponentially harder than anything I did in dual enrollment or anything I did in high school. And then most of them didn't get that four or five, whatever they needed. So they took the entire semester of the class, paid for the class, paid for the, or paid for the test, and then they don't get in. And I'm like, that sucks. <laughs> like, I could have gotten a C, right? You got I, the credit. Uh, yeah, you know, like, I got college credit for a class that was yeah. way easier than their class. Mm -hmm. And it was just, you know. So I feel like there's a there probably needs to be some sort of um, shift in that area. But the, I think the kind of the point is that high school is very important for students that are trying to get into college or don't know anything about college because either way important. it's like it's so influential to the way that they they view the university it's i mean i'm not like having this conversation with you guys is, was helping me realize but yeah yeah and another thing that they don't really tell you is that yes dual enrollment is important but it also depends on the type of school that you're going that's to. that's true so for example at penn um if you get dual enrollment um sometimes those credits don't transfer either mm. so no matter yeah. if you got some fours or fives, some fours might not get you credit. Some fives might not get you credit, and some uh, dual enrollment might not get you credit if that class isn't equivalent here. Yeah. So it really depends on your course of studies. There's so many mm. different layers. Not trying to bash Penn or anything, yeah. but different schools have different policies. Yeah. Well, that's any school, really, honestly. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Hey, ooh, it's so hard, especially if you don't know anything. And yeah. like us coming as like first generation people. And to, our parents don't know how this oh, whole process nah. worked or anything like that. And so, like, we just coming in, like, oh, yeah, yeah like, yeah. fresh, doe-eyed, like, oh, this is going to be great. And then yeah. you kind of get hit with a whole bunch of different um, obstacles yeah. um, that and get in the way. Especially financially. Financially, aid, yeah, financial yeah. obstacles, yeah. especially. And, like, you thinking, oh, it's like, just take all the loans. Just take yeah, all, yeah, you know, yeah. it'll be fine. We'll <laughs> yeah. pay it off. As long as you have the degree, you'll be fine. Yeah. And then they're not thinking about, like, you're paying $800, $700 a month after mm. you graduate. Like, yeah. I yes, got that's really where I'm at right now. I have, <laughs> yeah. I have 80K of loans, and in my mind, I was like, um, so Penn has a um, 
what is it called grant based um, mm-hmm. financial aid program so you don't have to pay that money back but um, and it's need based too so in my oh. mind I was low income but my dad owned a business uh. and so that looks a little different and when you own houses that's a, another thing so they see all of that as assets but yeah. my dad was making total my both of my parents together were making less than thirty thousand dollars a year that's and then ridiculous. all of the houses that they owned they owed money on the house mm. so I ended up paying twenty four thousand dollars every year and so by the time I graduated it was a hundred thousand dollars and in my mind I was like I'm paying for this great education this is fine this is gonna be worth <laughs> it I thought I was gonna go to med school afterwards yeah. that didn't happen because it was hard right yeah. I'm taking all these hard classes I'm just you just get beat down after beat yeah, down. And yeah, it just, yeah. It's just rough. It's and rough. then you, it's kind of like there, you get to a point where there's no turning back. Mm-hmm. You know, and you're like, I'm in yeah. too deep. I yeah, gotta just yeah. keep going. I gotta and like, finish. I just, as yeah. long as I, I get through. Especially yeah. coming from an immigrant household, it's like you're not. But quitting. that's the pressure, right? Yeah, like you're not that quitting. you're told that there's no other option other than going to mm. college and school. Like this is the way to succeed, at least in the U.S. You know, centric yeah. concept uh, context. And so, yeah, it's tough. It's a lot of pressure to kind of they um they make you feel as though like when you're coming from an immigrant household and i got a little lucky because my sister is four or five years ahead of me so i saw her go through the process Mm -hmm. and she was able to help me out but for the most part even like it with that much time i still i was having struggle like i was struggling with financial aid as far as filling everything out getting all the documents Mm -hmm. and then you don't realize what i didn't realize was that i had to pay every time that i needed like a transcript or if i needed a test score or if I wanted to, like any little paperwork that had to be sent yeah. or received somewhere, you had to pay for it. And when you, like, you, like, kind of in that situation, my parents, like, my dad made a lot of money, but he also paid a lot for, like, he had to take care of me, my sister, my mom, my grandparents, our family in DR. The house was a little, you know, he didn't, right. he didn't make good financial choices. Mm-hmm. So it's like, that, like, all they see is, the house and two or three dependents, right. but they don't see all the other things that they have to pay for the, the cars, parts. you know, the emergencies that happen. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of um, this weird. I I feel as though the university hasn't caught up to the rest of the society. At least with marginalized people. Yeah, I think, yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, and there's different policies too, right? So different institutions, obviously, they have to make money somehow. Mm-hmm. So obviously they're going to admit legacy students or people who are fully paying for everything or they're going to and they're also going to balance that with students who are low income because they get Pell Grants they get a lot of state funding and so it's just a balance of those things and trying to obviously we try to create a a balanced class I obviously don't make the final decisions to any of these things Um, but there's a lot of factors that really go into it and you you want to make a change, but at the point where people are applying to college, it's really hard. And with financial aid, it's that's just a whole nother ball. Yeah, like, yeah. So much. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, as far as where you both are now, like, what mm-hmm. kind of inspired you to get into the work that you do? You can go first. <laughs> <laughs> Did I throw her into the bus? No. <laughs> okay. I'm like, yeah. I mean, to start just back when undergrad happened studying psychology like I was always really interested in human behavior and the way that people's minds worked and stuff Mm -hmm. like that that was always a huge interest of mine um but once I kind of got through that program at my undergrad I like started to see like if something wasn't clicking for me like I needed something more it wasn't just about the individual I needed to see more of like the other factors are involved in that person's life or you know, uh, history, familial Mm. history and stuff like that. And kind of like the sociology part of it. Right. Exactly. That was what I was missing. The sociology aspect. And my junior year, I was lucky enough to, um, study abroad in Cape Town, South Africa, which has a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. (laughs) Um, so that has like, you know, obviously a big history and stuff like that. And only it's been what, 26 years since apartheid and all of that. And so the racial tensions are really high. But while I was there, I did take a social psychology course. And so Mm. that kind of really opened my eyes. Yeah. 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 yeah, It was really, um, heavy and stuff, but I learned so much about race and power relations Mm. and all of that stuff, um, within the like South African context, but also like a world world context too and that for me was just like oh my god this is exactly what I kind of want to learn about and and work on in my life um and so once I you know I graduated I couldn't really find a job for a little while because a psych degree you really need (laughs) more than just that and I at the time obviously I didn't know that again Mm. coming in as like an immigrant kid I'm just thinking oh like I'll find a job I'll do whatever um and then come to find out you need like a whole bunch of other things um but 
uh, I did eventually, you know, find a job and stuff like that. But at that point, I did apply for grad school and social work yeah. again because of that social psychology kind of aspect that I'd learned about. Um, I was just so inclined in it. And like the ethics of social work, it's really about social justice and like systems of oppression and trying to dismantle all of that. And that for me has always been a very core value of mine mm. just for a very long time now. Um, and so it just felt like the right fit. And it was really just about figuring out um, in the program how I could kind of build my skills mm. um, in that area. And so social work. And through that program, um, I was able to, to do different internships. And so I worked with like um, an immigrant uh, organization there in Philly. Um, I worked specifically with the anti-human trafficking team. And so that was something that also kind of opened my eyes to like a whole different population than I'd ever worked before. Um, I also worked at a law center working with uh, youth in the child welfare system and the justice system. So I got to see a little bit of that side, working with young people too. Um, and then now I'm currently working with adults with intellectual disabilities and helping them navigate those systems. So wow. very varied yeah, it's a type whole, of thing. Yeah, yeah, I'm just like, who can I help next, you know? <laughs> yeah. um, and then, you know, obviously I speak Spanish. And so like that's been uh, at all the agencies that I've been at, it's been a huge help yeah, because yeah. I can imagine. Uh, also, in addition, like I did go into social work because I felt like there weren't enough Spanish speaking social workers. That's true. Um, yeah. And culturally competent ones. And so I was like, listen, if it's not there, I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to be, be the yeah. person who does it because yeah. um, it's needed and it's necessary. Um, and we should have access to those resources as, as a community. Yeah. So. You're yeah. so cool. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Oh, um, for me, um, I'm going to say, I'll be 100% honest, I'm a little selfish in a lot mm. of the things that I do. Um, so <laughs> I, when I first started college, um, uh, I decided to apply to Penn. It was the best school that I got into. Um, I got into psychology. I didn't get into psycholo psychology originally. I was undecided. Um, mm. And I wanted, because I went to, got accepted into the school, I was like, let me go ahead and be a doctor. That's yeah. what I'm going to do. That's what's going to happen. And obviously, when you're an immigrant from the Dominican Republic, a lot of the things are engineer, doctor, or lawyer. Those are yeah. the three careers that you kind of can be that is successful, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's what I was thinking. And then as I got into my university, I was really inspired by gender and women's studies. That was one of the things that I definitely wanted to learn about. I love being a feminist or what I thought was what it was to be a feminist because mm -hmm. you learn a lot that it's a, it's very whitewashed. Um, the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the department at least, or, or at least the, the studies, it's a lot of like white women kind of talking about all and these their history things. And their versus, hi versus like, the, the full spectrum. The, yes, yeah. the contributions that yeah. brown and black women are doing in this mm. field. And so I was really inspired by that, and I wasn't really sure what exactly I wanted to do after I kind of struggled with these courses um, in the sciences. Um, so I decided to do psychology because my, my mom and my sister were both psychology um, we're doing psychology and I was oh, so it's like a family thing it's a little yeah. bit of a family it thing it became a family thing <laughs> it became a family thing I honestly to be 100% honest I still don't know what I want to do but I do love the work that I'm doing now so um, undecided eventually ended up with psychology eventually, eventually ended up with gender sexuality and women's studies I graduated still didn't know what to do mm -hmm. but kind of what, what Cammy was saying um, you don't know what to do with a psych degree right yeah. but I had really great connections and so I ended up getting like a part time job right after and that worked out in housing. I was doing similar stuff like what I was doing in undergrad. And then finally, I got to this work that was both everything that I wanted to do. Like, I love to travel. I love to talk to people. Mm -hmm. I'm a really great recruiter, I think, in my eyes. I love to just connect with people and get them to be invested as much as I am into something uh, to get them invested in this new thing. Yeah. And so... Um, admissions just really fit perfectly. I had to present in front of like hundreds of people. I had to sell the idea of this institution. And then I also was able to travel. So all of those things kind of went into that. Um, and now after three years of doing it, I love it. I love education. I love being able to shape people's futures. I love the idea of being able to really educate someone on the admissions process because we all need that. That's something that's super important that you don't know about. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of how I got into it. It's a little bit of a zigzag, but yeah. it ended up being the perfect fit, yeah. at least right now. I feel like we always end up where we're supposed to be. Exactly. You mm -hmm. know, for the most part, if you if you move in the direction that you, I would say, is healthiest for you, mm -hmm. you end up where you're supposed to be. 
But that, you know, I think there's a lot of, how should I put this into words? There's a lot of necessity for kind of leading the younger generation in a direction away from the, you know, go to school, get a job. Like we don't like we don't live in that kind of world anymore where you can just get a degree, get a job, get your retirement and be done. Mm-hmm. And kind of like what you're saying with psych, a psych degree. I feel like there's it's not something that's linear. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah it doesn't. It, a psych it. degree doesn't get you a job. Just like a criminal justice degree doesn't get you a job. Like when I was in high school, I wanted to be a police officer at one point where I wanted I wanted to eventually get into the FBI. I can see that. But I <laughs> but I started by wanting to get into law enforcement. Mm-hmm. And then I was looking into criminal justice degrees and uh, I started watching all the cop shows and, yeah, you know, CSI, CSI Law and Order. And the thing that I saw, though, was that none of them ever went to college. You know, the people on TV always talked about getting into the academy, getting into the, the field and working their way up. But none of it was ever college. So I looked into a criminal justice degree and it doesn't really get you anything. You know, it's kind of like the it's just a degree it's mm-hmm. kind of like an art degree too like the thing Maybe about a paralegal you can get yeah and it's it's just crazy how for for an art de- art degree for example that doesn't really make you a better artist it doesn't make you a more qualified artist than somebody that doesn't have a degree so i think we're putting a lot of like focus on the academic. a lot of energy on the the degree itself when that doesn't really qualify you for what you're supposed to be doing i mean something that they don't tell you is well they do tell you but like you don't really realize until you're actually working and you're out of school and stuff like that it's like a networking yeah yeah, it's literally just who you know who can you who can now that's like more that's That's more emphasized to get you in the door but i think another thing that they don't tell you is all the skills you gain for me i didn't learn any of anything that i know now in school Mm. i learned it through the organizations that i was involved with the people that i knew the jobs Mm. that i had all those internships that's what got me where i am today and so after graduation it was really about the work that i was doing um the skills that i was gaining in the workplace it was never about school for me yeah and another thing that i don't know if you touched on is the fact that yes it's not directly directly linear like you might have one degree but might not do it there are some degrees that are like that but i think it's also important to follow your passions in a way i think a lot of the time there's so much pressure to be professional to graduate with a degree right now my parents are giving me so much pressure Mm. to be in in graduate school i don't even know if i want to keep going to school you might not even need it exactly and so i i know someone that graduated with a bachelor's and is making six figures right now Mm. and she's working in hr and she's done it for her whole life she doesn't need a degree she she has all the experience yeah. that she needs and so for me i really value my my workplace environment i love the people that i like i need to love the people that i'm working with otherwise i'm going to be miserable um <laughs> yeah. i need to not be sitting at a desk 24 7 all of those things are important on things that no one talks about when you're going to school when yeah. they're telling you you need to get a degree in order to get yeah. a good job yeah they don't really touch on the environment aspect of it or your happiness your mm. mental well-being yeah all of that no is so one important. cares about that it's so <laughs> sad yeah. they just care about the money and what you make like they yeah. want to in a way for some for a lot of i think our, our communities it's like the academic side it's like that's what validates you like you're mm. not important unless you have that yeah and that is so it leads harmful to the money. it leads to the money yeah that's yeah that's what it, it's yeah. supposed to lead to that and, and i think it's just so harmful because we're missing out on so many other yeah. things that are important in life like do i honestly yes would i like more money a hundred percent. I would love to have more money. But at the same time, is money going to get me happiness? Because more money means more responsibilities. It means that I don't have a work-life mm. balance. It means that if I want to go out on a Friday night, I might not be able to because I have yeah. all this stuff that I need to get done. And you, there's this need to keep moving up the ladder and like do all these things and impress the all these people. Race. But there's yeah. also this politics game that you also have to play. Um, and it's also about being palatable to your the people that are yeah. around you. So there's just... Honestly, yeah. there's so much. And it's also, nobody talks about the other side where um, someone would argue and be like, oh, money doesn't buy you happiness, but it buys you things that make you happy. But at the same time, when you eventually get the money to have that thing, it probably won't make you happy anymore mm-hmm. because you've already gone through so much. Like, we see so many celebrities now that are depressed and, like, they're coming out and talking about it. We, are, we always see, um, like, the 2000s was a big 
a big time span where celebrities were really going through it. Britney Spears mm-hmm. being an, an example of how just because you have all these things, it doesn't mean that you're happy. It doesn't mean that you're necessarily successful emotionally and mentally. Yeah. And we, we miss that a lot. And I feel like that's now leaking with social media. It's kind of leaking into the everyday person because we can all kind of get that taste of fame a little bit here and there. Yeah, I think that's because no one is, well, I, speaking from my personal perspective, not generalizing it, I think no one ever taught you or us how to deal with mental health. Mm-hmm. No one ever taught you how to speak about your emotions. No one ever taught us how to navigate in a world where we weren't trying to do something to get validation, mm-hmm. right? So now that you're here, now you're like, my parents always wanted this for me, or I've been pressured to do this, yeah. but now what do I want? As soon as you graduate, as soon as you get a job, as soon as you move out, now the question is, what, what, do you, what, do you what do? the hell yeah. do you do with my life? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, we are talking about that earlier. It's like uh, all of my life goals have kind of surmounted to like academic goals and like graduating and getting yeah. this degree and this. Okay, I have that. Okay, uh, now, what? you know, I have my own apartment with my sister. Yeah. I have a car, you know, we're paying the loans. <laughs> and then it's like, okay, what now, now what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what's next? What do I don't do know. know. All that. Right. Um, and so it's just a matter of uh, finding things outside of that, too, that, that are important mm-hmm. to you. Yeah, I'm finding that out now, living with my sister, that you kind of have to figure out what, what your you hobbies do. are. What yeah, you, you have you know, to what you figure love yourself and out. And who you want to yeah. be around and and what you're looking forward to, like, yeah, exactly. for next year or whatever, you know, in your future. Yeah, because yeah. you, know, you don't get that question. Again, being from the yeah. type of household that we're from, it's do this for your family. Yeah. Do this so that you can make us happy. And it's not necessarily their fault because it's also the way mm-hmm. they were raised. Yeah. And they worked very hard to get us the opportunities that we have. Mm-hmm. So there's kind of like a you have to you have to pay it back, at least in that way. But there's there's the disconnect between what are you going to do after that? What are you going to do for yourself? Yeah. Exactly. And I, th- I, f- I think we're getting a little better here, but there needs to be more dialogue. There needs to be more conversations with the younger crowd because they shouldn't have to wait until they're in college broke and <laughs> eating ramen mm-hmm. noodles every day mm-hmm. to figure all this stuff out yeah and i think it honestly needs to be a conversation too that it's not just necessarily about college it's not necessarily about getting that job it's also about okay what are the things that make you happy um how can you um really explore yourself your interests your what makes you tick all of these things make you a human being and it's not just about what education that you're getting or about what car you're riding when you get older it's about how can you get the best out of life? And another thing that they don't really talk about is there are a lot of things that you can do outside of just going to college oh, to yeah. be successful. There are so many things. There's so many artistic things. There's so many technical things. An electrician can make hella money. Oh, and we're, we're not, figuring that out now. Yeah. For sure, yeah. Trade school is exactly the move sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. So all of those things are really important. And I really want to touch back on what you were saying earlier that we want to pay back what our parents have done, right? So our parents, um, my mom came from the country like there was really not much going on mm-hmm. anywhere it was like wooden picket fence with a little <laughs> barbed wire yeah, yeah. and mm-hmm. there were cows everywhere and the roads weren't paved that's where she came from my dad came from a town that did have a road but it I, I, in comparison to like the u.s standards yeah. it's absolutely not it's, exactly, tra- it's basically you know? a trail exactly yeah. <laughs> the, the lights went out very regularly you still rode donkeys if you needed to get somewhere mm. it wasn't like a town town and then eventually me and my sister were both born in the city my parents love to tell the story so i'm kind of Mm. saying it through their kind of eyes but then we were born in the Dominican Republic in the city like in La Capital and then we moved to the US and now it's like there's a breath of opportunities yeah. and so you see where your parents came from the hard work that they had to do mm. them having to get water yeah. and heat up the water growing and their just, own food exactly <laughs> yeah. all of those yeah. things it's crazy and you sometimes you feel terrible about like getting to where you went to a really great school and you don't know what you want to do (laughs) and it sucks and it's like i want to make you proud and i want to get you that second degree that's what you want but that's not what i want and so how can you balance those two things of i want to make you proud i know that where you've been and i'm thankful for you getting me here but i also Mm. have to do my own thing yeah Yeah. i'm starting to figure out with my parents that it's not necessarily that they want you to get that second degree. They just want you to keep leveling up. You know, they want to see you in a better place than you are today. And they they might not even understand that themselves. But, for example, when I haven't done anything more, aside from the podcast, I haven't 
uh, physically done anything more than go to school and work and stuff. You but, are well, an athlete. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, but I mean, as far as from in my parents' eyes, right? So in my parents' eyes, yeah, That's right? yeah. It's like their perspective <laughs> yeah, on it. Like exactly. we might be like hot shit to yeah. all of our friends or whatever. Exactly. But so to when, them, it's like, oh, que when, tu haciendo? Let's go <laughs> pick it up. Let's yeah, go. yeah. <laughs> you know. So when I when I kind of got into this apartment with my sister, and I got in, I really got into the stock market. Mm-hmm. And um, I just had like some extra money laying around, and yeah. my my dad started to notice. He's like, "Oh!" And like immediately, like something in him was felt better about my situation. You know, even mm-hmm. though I was still in the same trajectory for school, yeah. I was still playing baseball, I was still like doing the everyday things. He sees me kind of that having for- a little bit more of a future. Right. That for him was an initiative. Yeah, exactly. Head. So I think there's also this inner kind of subconscious feeling in our parents that they don't know how to communicate what they actually want Mm -hmm. but they're the way that they do is by saying you know get your get into grad school Mm -hmm. get a better job get you know get signed you know all these things that they're trying to get you to do is kind of just to make sure that what they did that you're okay yeah exactly and it makes sense it makes sense because they may not have had that stability Mm -hmm. so they want that stability for us that when they're gone we're going to be fine that we whatever we end up doing that we don't need their money or like we don't need to be asking for help that they we are sufficient on our own Mm. but i think sometimes they forget that we're human beings too and that we need a little bit of affirmation yeah Yeah. i mean what you were talking about their history and stuff from where they come from it's really um oh my god i lost my train of thought i had a thought uh what was (laughs) a thought it was a thought it the way the way they they were like raised. Oh, um. Oh my God. Affirmation. No. No. Pressure. Mm, no. It was something regarding their history, and then it was gonna lead to. Oh, um. That basically, um. They're based on their history and where they come from. They didn't necessarily have a choice. They, they were have just options. like, I am going here, and this is that's gonna yeah. get me out of here, and that mm. is the only thing I have. And so now us being here, or like you know, immigrating to the U.S. and stuff like that, we have options, we have choices. Mm. And so, like, that is a huge privilege yeah. that they didn't have. And so, like, obviously very grateful for it, but also it's like, okay, you 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 let me here, and so, like, now kind of give me the yeah. option to yeah. figure it out. And that I think for them it, 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 it might be difficult for them to see that, yeah. that, that we might not necessarily um, want to do the, things, the, the things that they've kind of set for us yeah. to do. Um, mm. So, yeah, I think that's definitely, like, an- another struggle. Yeah, I mean, well, they so. didn't have the option to go to school or become an entrepreneur. Right. You know, mm-hmm. they didn't have uh, become an influencer mm-hmm. or go to yeah. med school. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> much know? has changed. Yeah, they, they came. can't build their Instagram uh, exactly. influence. They can't build their business on Instagram. Right. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like, I, I my mom specifically, if she would have uh, been, I guess, raised in this country with the skills that she has, you know, she could sew, she can reupholster, she can do hair, she can do nails, just all these things that she learned how to do mm-hmm. for free, basically. She didn't go to school. She just, she did it on her own with her friends and in her community in Dominican Republic. If she was here, she would have an entire business online or she would have her her own whole mm-hmm. salon that she'd be able to do things in. Yeah. So I think that's the other thing that they don't, we see that because of how we see these opportunities and where we've come from. But they're just like, you know, I brought you here to go to school and get a job because <laughs> that's what I, I did. Or that's what I couldn't do. Yeah. So there, there's a lot of hidden, I guess, there's a lot of nuance in the, the disconnect course. between first generation immigrants and their kids. Mm-hmm. And sometimes it's like you're ungrateful or yeah, like yeah. You're, you're lazy yeah. or uh, <laughs> so many things. And yeah. you start feeling it within yourself. It's like, shit. Well, my parents could did it, could do it. Why can't I do it? They had yeah. to. Exactly. They had to. Yeah. They didn't have a choice. But I think we also have to not to bring race into it. Um, but just being in this mm. country, there's just certain sometimes the things are just yeah. there are bigger obstacles than you know when DR mm. obviously ever it's a little bit obviously little, racially more diverse, level. but everyone's yeah. on the same sort of level type yeah. thing. And so coming here, and it's like we're going it's more against. Class there. As mm-hmm. opposed to race there. I mean, I think it's still, I think race still applies for sure. Because at the end of the day, like across the mm-hmm. world, darker people suffer most. Yeah, but. But I, at least when I, I'm talking in terms of like us coming here to the mm-hmm. U.S. And like coming against facing white supremacy on yeah. a little bit more than kind of over there, I think. Yeah. Um, and the fact of the way that institutions in this country are set up to mm-hmm. like have systemically oppressed 
people of color. Yeah. And so it's like, those are also additional, like we don't, you know, they think that it doesn't really exist, but it does. That is a huge barrier. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, you talked about it a little bit with like your students coming into um, Penn and school. And so that, that's also a thing that's affecting us in our job opportunities, you know, our names. Yeah. You know, I think being a little strange and like maybe mm-hmm. they're not going to really review our, you know, application, our resume, it. right? Yeah. Based on our name or whatever. Those are types of things that they're also not seeing. They're just mm. like, well, why didn't you get the job? <laughs> why didn't you get, you know, like, and yeah. I'm like, no, I mean, not, not that we know, like, obviously, if a person's hiring us or not, if that was the case, but those are also more likely things that are going on yeah. behind the scenes. Yeah. Um, that well, well over there, I don't think race does play a role but i don't yeah. think it matters as much because like you said everyone's kind of on a more similar playing field there, and mm-hmm. it's more about it's it is still about connections and mm-hmm. who's hiring you but it's more about skill too yeah. you know, over there they don't have the the pl- they don't have the the luxury to kind of pick and choose whoever they want it's like mm-hmm. if you're in a small business or you're in a, a small town you pick whoever is qualified for the job. Yeah. Here you have millions of people to choose from. So they have that luxury to be like, ah, I don't really, mm-hmm. you know, that's not the vibe. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, the thing is that's racialized too. I was literally just listening to um, uh, an event that was talking about how practices, at least here, not there, mm-hmm. obviously, um, but how there are practices where it's not, if you have more years of something, if mm-hmm. you have more education in something, all of that, it's kind of class. If you yeah, have the money yeah. to it, you're going to have the preparation for it and you're going to have the skills for it. But now um, they're trying to, to build more competence, competencies into it so that students um, and whoever's applying can say, I have these competencies. It doesn't matter how mm-hmm. many years I've been in it. It doesn't matter my education, but I can do the work yeah. just the same as someone else who has a degree who did this many years. Yeah. You know, So that's interesting. Yeah. So what about... Something that you guys talked about, you, what you mentioned in your upbringing and your your academic history, is that you both are kind of into women's studies and mm-hmm. that kind of um, feminism and bringing that equality into the gender conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me, um, it was just always important as a woman and as a woman of color um, to just be, I guess, a part of a conversation. I think um, I didn't know a lot when I was in high school about anything. If I'm mm, who be does? 100% <laughs> honest. Yeah, who uh, do, you think yeah. you know, and then you don't. No, yeah. You find out you don't. Yeah. Exactly. And then for me, it was always about, um, I wanted to learn a little bit more stuff, and I wanted to just see women who look like me in different places. I wanted to understand why we weren't at different places. I wanted to understand why we were looked at differently. And Mm -hmm. I also wanted to understand looking at my own background and where I came from, why my cousins that were guys are doing stuff that I wasn't doing. And I don't understand why I was viewed differently as them in my mind. I love me to, I love playing some Xbox. I love me. I love doing that. And my mom would not buy me an Xbox. And for me, that was like, why, why can't I have an Xbox if I want to play, what is it called? Call of Duty. Yeah. yeah. What, or, or Halo. I loved Halo. Yeah. Halo. Um, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. I love that <laughs> stuff, but my mom was not, never about it. But then my cousin who lived with me and grew up with me, cousin, uncle, um, he had all the games. Mm-hmm. Anytime he wanted a game, he could get a game. Anytime he wanted to go out anywhere, he could go out anywhere. Yeah. If I wanted to have a boyfriend, I couldn't have a boyfriend. I had a, my sister had to chaperone me to go places or my parents had to be there mm-hmm. in order for me to do whatever. And so I think we saw a lot of those differences between us and like our cousins and our male yeah. cousins and just yeah. Exactly. And it, it just was, felt like I was not and I and I got to college, I was not equipped to handle social situations. Mm-hmm. I don't have any male friends for that reason. I only have girlfriends because I was never allowed to be yeah. with guys. Yeah. Um, I don't have healthy relationship skills because I don't know how to have a f- relationship because all my parents told me was don't have sex before you get married. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> how am I supposed yeah. to understand how yeah. to have a proper healthy relationship, how to meet people in a healthy way, and how to be a, like... How just to communicate. L- Exactly, yeah, and yeah. how to function in a world where I am going to be viewed as an angry black woman sometimes, mm-hmm. where I am going to be viewed as incompetent, or um, where I am going to be viewed as sensitive. Mm-hmm. Like, someone's going to come to me, like, I get frustrated and I cry. That's just how I know how to deal with my emotions. Mm-hmm. And it's annoying to live in the world as it is, and I went on a completely different tangent. No, that's, all right. that's, part, of, that's part of it, though. But that's just how I... 
I saw the world, how I experienced the world, and I wanted to understand what those layers were, and that's why I studied that in college, for me at least. That's where it came from. Yeah, I mean, I think at the time I was just very involved in the internet, such as like Twitter and Tumblr mm. and stuff like that, and a lot of the social justice conversations were started kind of there, um, or at least that was my introduction to it. And then I eventually kind of did some academic classes and stuff like that and learned a lot more. Um, but I think very similar to Caro, I think for me, it was just college at that time. I really wanted to know kind of my place in the world and wh how my identity affected the people around me and how people treated me. And like, why was it that like some things were happening for me versus other people and stuff like that. So that was always, again, the human behavior kind of psychology aspect yeah, yeah. Um, was really interesting to me. And then once I started learning more about like gender studies and like feminism, womanism, intersectionality, all those things, um, it like it just clicked. It was just like, oh my God, like a, something went off and I'm like, oh, this makes so much sense. This is why things are this way or like this is uh, the things keeping us from, you know, reaching our full potential or whatever the history may be for marginalized identities um, and genders and stuff and sexualities. Um, and so like that for me was just really interesting to kind of learn about and then apply it to kind of myself and then my friends and yeah. then it was just, kind of grew from there and just this general idea of like I you know I have this privilege in this world but at the same time I do have a lot of oppressions that's like a black queer woman you know um and so how can I both advocate for myself and then advocate for other people mm. um so like learning about learning that kind of feminist kind yeah. of history and stuff um I apply that to kind of my everyday life the way I engage with people is very you know it's the same across the board you know at the end of the day it all comes down to respect and if yeah. you respect me i respect you back um those kinds of things and yeah yeah that's yeah, yeah that's kind of kind of how i i grew into it and so that's really important to me and um i kind of tend to only surround myself with people who and not to be like i only surround myself with people who think similar to me but like in general who have those same values and yeah. ideas um, and who respect other people. Well, I mean, there's, I, I think there's a healthy way to surround yourself with right. people that think the way you do. Mm -hmm. Like if you're, if you're really doing the work, um, uh, kind of the points that you touched on is learning about yourself, learning about your history and where you come from. If you really do that work, it's kind of hard to create an ignorant bubble because mm -hmm. there's, you know, once yeah. you figure certain things out, you yeah, can't like, really unknow them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you have people around you that have that same, uh, intelligence or the same know-how it's it's gonna be a healthier situation instead of just a bunch of people that don't know anything about their family history don't know anything about their people or or how they identify with themselves that's right. it's a lot easier for for you to to walk around in an with an ignorant mindset mm -hmm. 100%. but I, th I think the the family dynamic that you guys touched on is super important too because even with myself being the the younger brother there was a lot of there was a lot of privilege that I had that I didn't realize I had until I heard you the were stories. Mama's baby, yeah. <laughs> anything yeah. you wanted, you got. Yeah, and it was kind of in my eyes. It was in my eyes. It wasn't like that growing up because I only saw what I went through. I only saw what I didn't get. And then when I started thinking about, <laughs> I that's I'm you know yeah, when, no, like, yeah, I know yeah. That's you experience real. what you experience. Yeah, that's and so is. when I think about all the times where my sister would pretend to like take me somewhere just to go meet a boy. Right. Mm -hmm. Or she would be, she would volunteer to go pick me up from a birthday party or something so that she could, you know, go Have a little bit more freedom. Yeah, exactly. Because just so she could go out. Yeah. The, the, just the fact that you were attached. Exactly. Granted her that freedom. Yeah. And I'm like four Whereas years, I'm four years younger than her. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she can do whatever she wants. Yeah. And then, cause from, from my perspective, I, we, we still had like the, the strict household where I, I couldn't really make a lot of friendships. I couldn't really go right, too yeah. many places, mm -hmm. but I still had, even then I still had more freedom than she did, especially because I played sports yeah. so I could travel. I could, you know, be out of the house a little longer throughout the day. I had kind of the, the excuse to, to go out and practice or go out and work out. And there was just a lot, there was in comparison to, to our individual experiences, I had way more freedom, but overall it seems like there was no, not much of a difference. And a lot of that is not only because of the the gender difference, but it's also because of the the culture. You know, in our in, I I would say in a lot of um, Latino Hispanic culture is is very, how should I say, very restricting to women. 
and especially women of darker color you know you get a, colorism you get, plays yeah a role, so it's well, yeah a <laughs> it's a it's a lot of it's a lot of that and being in a separate country and now not only are you in that environment but you're isolated from the rest of the world because your parents are not they don't have they don't really talk to their neighbors you know mm-hmm. they don't really talk to your school staff. They don't mm-hmm. talk to. They, they're not in like these. Or they PTO. might not have, been, not have been able to communicate. Yeah, exactly. With them at the time. Yeah. So, so now, not only are you guys in this um, restrictive culture, but now it's just you and your bubble, bubble of your family. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think there's we're slowly moving away from that again. But it's like I keep saying, it's important to identify that so that we can fix those issues before they become issues <laughs> yeah but and that's the thing it's about identifying it like thinking critically yeah. about your own household and like because like again the two same household different experiences mm-hmm. exactly like so yeah sometimes we have to get out of our own head of like what the me 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 experience versus oh how did like this person experience yeah. the situation what's reality mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and same thing with us too like me and my sister had completely different experiences and that's something that you have to come to terms with understand mm-hmm. your privileges as a younger sibling I was also yeah. a younger sibling okay. My sister was an older sibling. In my mind, I had to do everything. But <laughs> that's not how she perceived I, it. No. Um, <laughs> I felt like I had to go through everything <laughs> so that you could go through your stuff um, exactly. and have an easier kind of path. Um, yeah, that's how I kind of see it as the older sister. I'm like, I had to go through it all. Yeah. You know, and because like even just like with going to school, like I commuted all four years versus you were like, nah, I'm going to go live I, there. Yeah. Like I she told was them like I so, was so adamant I yeah. needed to but live But that was campus. an option that was just not for me. Like yeah. I just could not think we're only a year apart. So, yeah. you know, it's like crazy. She she I knew that that wasn't something that I was supposed to do, but, but I lied so I could live on campus. Yeah. Right. She, yeah. So she did what she had to do versus me. I'm like, I'm following the rules, you know? Yeah, like, that's, I'm just, how, my, yeah, that's you know? how my sister was. It was this is how like, it's supposed to be, so I yeah. have to do this. I don't have a choice in doing this versus like, okay, well, now they've let this one go. Oh, maybe this one can actually be okay. Yeah. You know? When but it's not like I went far. I right. literally yeah. went <laughs> yeah. 15 minutes away from my house. I just never, I literally talked to them maybe once every month Mm. because i needed that space i needed to To grow as a person and that's like so important and i felt like it really wasn't until my junior year again when i studied abroad that i was like halfway across the country that i could felt that i felt like i had even sort of country like the world the the world world. yeah halfway four or five thousand miles away what's that um but yeah basically i had to learn how to be independent how to be Mm. myself and how to take care of myself and be surrounded by different people and people that i didn't know at all and live with them and that was yeah. insane because I'd only ever been surrounded by family or like really close, you know, family friends and stuff. And so that was a completely different experience, um, but so necessary mm-hmm. for my growth and yeah. my ability to kind of yeah. be who I am today. Um, I guess we have that that sort of similarity with my sister. She stayed. She went away to college, but mm-hmm. she's also super rebellious. Like yeah. when she when she was a really uh, tell me more. I'm just <laughs> <kidding>. <laughs> when she was a teenager, you you would literally tell her to do something just so that she would do the opposite. Yeah. But uh, it, like it didn't matter what it was. If you told her to put on a jacket because it's cold outside, she will go outside with less layers on. I feel like that's how mommy and daddy think about me. But I feel like I follow the rules all the time, and then I was now apparently. The I'm, yeah. I'm the rule breaker. <laughs> That's but, another. <laughs> yeah, no. See, the, I guess the difference there would be my sister was more, um, she more blatantly broke the rules, okay. and yeah. I got really good at finessing the mm-hmm. rules. Mm-hmm. So I went That was out me of in state. high school. Yeah. Me in high school, every time, like the whole boyfriend thing, I mm. wanted to have a boyfriend. I was not allowed to have a boyfriend. Yeah. I was going to have a boyfriend anyway. Yeah. <laughs> I needed to go out with my friends. I told my, my parents I was out of place. I was not at that place. Mm-hmm. It's not like I was doing anything crazy. I wasn't drinking. I wasn't yeah. doing drugs. But I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. Yeah. But you twisted the rules so you could have a little bit more freedom. A little more freedom. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. So I would, I, what I would do is I would say that I was out of place. And then I would go to a different place. But I would go to that place. You know, I would be at that place at least for, like for a second. Yeah. So for you a, can say. You yeah. Did it. So, so I'm not totally lying. Mm-hmm. But a the lot of times. The secrets come out 10, <laughs> year, ten years later. <laughs> like, Hopefully we're, your parents we're, are watching this. Yeah, we're yeah. safe. We live in our own yeah, homes. Yeah, They're not going to come for we're us. Not, yeah, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just funny how you kind of like have these. You have this situation where you're being almost. I don't want to use the word oppressed because oppression is like really strong. But as a 
at that age, it feels like oppression. Yeah, yeah, like restricted. I mean, or you're very restricted. Just the way you're talking about it, it just sounds like our parents just had authoritarian parenting style. I don't yeah. know if you've ever heard of yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you basically, it's like what I say goes, and then yeah, you don't really it. have a say. And so there yeah. wasn't like that kind of like, oh, what do you? How do you feel about mm. this? <laughs> I don't know that. <laughs> I know <nobody laughs> ask me how I feel. They will never <laughs> ask me how yeah. I feel about like us going somewhere or like me deciding to do whatever. Um, yeah. And so it's it like was never an option. There was not right. Yeah. Like we didn't. Have and an but option. again, going back to that point, they they didn't but have it was the for option. Safety, though. Yeah, it's and about like survival. Survival. Yeah. Over or, when yeah. when they so were I growing up, that for sure. you have to listen to your parents because that's how you survive. Mm-hmm. If you don't listen to your parents in that time, it's like you're gonna be out on the street, or you're gonna right. be dead, or you're gonna be pregnant, mm-hmm. or you're gonna have pregnant. a yeah. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> literally. Yeah. Like yes. it literally, that's what it was, though. You know, there's no, there maybe now, but there was no contraception whatsoever. <laughs> like our grandparents all have fifty kids with yep. with twenty women, <laughs> or it's just a ridiculous. <laughs> but now there's kind of that telling them, hey, there's a little more safety here. There's a little more consistency. We can kind of take care of ourselves a little better at this age than you could right. at your age, mm-hmm. just because of the systems that are in place to kind of like there's more of a safety net right. exactly and I, one thing that i want to go back to is this idea of understanding or um identifying the traumas that we face mm-hmm. and being able to move that forward that's a conversation that um our, we had with our cousin when she came over and we've we've been having with other cousins too just knowing that just because we had it a certain way doesn't mean that this is how it needs to be in the mm-hmm. future and also how do we un- stop that how yeah. do we trauma from Break continuing that, yeah. And that breaking that cycle, yeah. Exactly. We want to be, I think it's important to when, at least for me, it's important that although I had these experiences, that now I become self-aware, like what are my triggers? Uh, I need to understand also how to be a good sibling. I have a younger brother Mm -hmm. who all I know is what my parents have taught me. Mm -hmm. So when he does something out of line, the first thing I do is the same thing that my parents did. And I want to be able to have those conversations with him. I want him to have that person that can go to, that he can go to about anything. I want him to be able to say, hey sister, like I'm having a really tough time. Mm -hmm. My mental health isn't doing whatever. I want him to have that open conversation that we never had. And so... That's important to me, and I hope that when I have kids, if I have kids, that I'm going to be able to change that around. And I told my sister, I'm scared to have kids because my, my, my cousin says she's not scared to have kids mm-hmm. because she's like, I know the traumas that I faced, and I never want my children to experience that. And she's been an amazing mother. For me, I'm scared that I don't know anything else. And mm-hmm. like, yes, I studied psychology. Yes, I studied developmental psychology. But there's it's a, a different difference thing between... To- Learning yeah. practice, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, and so I've internalized so much, and I, in my mind, I turned out well. Like I'm thankful. I, I again, n- did not drink, did not get pregnant when I was younger. Just yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> might have happened yeah, here yeah. and there recreationally, yeah. but um, at the same time, I, I'm a pretty great individual. I yeah. make my own you're money. I live safe. on my own. Yeah. I you're self sustaining. Exactly. There's there's so many different things mm. that I I gained from the experience of having my parents be the way that they are, and I'm mm. thankful for them a hundred percent. Could it have been better? Yeah, yes. but that's you know, and the I we do have to um, appreciate the the things that we did get also. Like if it wasn't for the way that I was raised, I wouldn't know what it was to really earn something, yeah. to really work hard for what you yeah. what you get, and to kind of have that respect for authority. Because that's the that's the trouble we can get into if we're like if you're too soft on your kids, they don't respect you, and then in turn they won't respect anyone else out in society. You know, I see that now that you got a lot of kids that are not really kind of taking, they're not really appreciating the people that came before them that set up the platform that they're using today. But um, we do like. There's we have to identify the triggers, identify the trauma, and then also appreciate the the values and the morals that we were able to get from those yeah. experiences. And yeah. but there's no such thing as a perfect parent, you know. If if there was a a formula for perfect parenting, <laughs> <laughs> the world would be a whole different place. If there no. was a book, that would be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we just have to take the good things that you know mm-hmm. we appreciate and we love about them, and that's what we're gonna have to pass on. And we can hold off on the other stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, we can work and try to like build that patience and mm-hmm. stuff that they might not have had um, with us. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah. like, I. 
I hope that one day we can have co- real conversations with our parents. Mm-hmm. I think that's something that we definitely want to have and we're trying to have, but it doesn't always happen. Mm-hmm. And when it does, when you're trying to have those conversations, they get very much like, oh, they're, they're trying to start going off. Yeah, yeah, yeah they're yeah, like, yeah. oh, I'm of the bad parent. <laughs> oh, Immediately, I yeah. messed you up. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I was trying to provide for you. Yeah, yeah. And so all of those things are frustrating and it's like they can't apologize. Like mm. they I understand that why why they had to do what they had to mm. do, but at the same time, you should also be able to say, "Hey, look, I messed up. Yeah, I, I thought what I did was was right, but it wasn't, mm. and I'm sorry that it's caused you whatever pain or whatever issue." Just the acknowledgement is is what is enough. We'd love to hear. Yeah, yeah. that's what you're they, looking they can't, for. Yeah, you get there. You know, we're 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 yeah. building towards that. Yeah, exactly. we're we're kind of in that place too, yeah. having that conversation. And I want to be close hard. to my parents. It's hard. It's not easy yeah. at all. But that's. Yeah, I and I know. love them. I love hearing the stories. Mm-hmm. I love the knowledge that they have that they've grown to learn from going from such a humble beginning to where they are now. Like all of those things are really important to me and I don't want to lose that. But at the same time, it's really hard to say, hey, look, mom and dad, I've had mental health issues or hey, mom and dad. Um, to me, like I'm bisexual, but they kind of know, but they don't really know. Yeah, like, like for me, it's not super important for me to share that mm. with them, but I can't have that conversation yeah. with them. And like, I, I would just rather avoid having that conversation, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I love, I had it. She had it. <laughs> that was tough. Yeah. yeah. Don't recommend zero out of 10. Uh, yeah. You know? So I saw her experience. And for me, it, Honestly, like, oh, hell no, <laughs> not even that, not even that, because I she she needed to be her full authentic self. She couldn't yeah. do that while she yeah. was at home. I didn't feel comfortable. Um, yeah. Continuing to, to, to live the way I was without yeah. sharing that aspect of myself. And, and for me, it's a very small part of who I am. Right. I am bisexual, but I tend to lean towards um, the male sex. Mm. Um, and so for me or the male identity sure. um, <laughs> um but i also like women and so for me in my mind i'm not going to end up with a woman so mm. to them that's all that really matters it's like Who are you going to get married are yeah. you going to have kids who's your future with? exactly yeah. so i'm like i'm a wild card yeah so <laughs> it's whatever, truly... whatever happens happens <laughs> anything yeah. goes you know? exactly so so for me that's why it's not super important for me to have that conversation with them because you don't need to know about my sex life yeah that's just not important yeah. i mean they don't yeah. need to know about mine either but yeah. damn like at least <laughs> at least they ask you who might who might who might be dating or stuff like that i'm like it's, they a, it's hard to avoid it fully yeah, with me yeah. they're like we just not it doesn't about. exist over Nuh-uh, here no so mm-hmm. that's what's yeah. difficult you know like i'd love to have that regular mm-hmm. chat that i they think might there's, have. there's yeah. also a, a taboo with sex too oh i'm sure because i don't want to yeah. hear about my parents i'm sure they don't want to hear about mine right but that's not a conversation but the thing is it seems like our parents reduce sexuality to just being about sex where it's like it's actually just, mm. you know, companionship, having a yeah. relationship with someone and stuff like that. And, and it's, it'd be nice to get tips from them to be like, how have you been in a marriage? My parents for, are actually yeah. ce- celebrating their anniversary tomorrow. They're 27 That's years great. together. That's like a, yeah. about the same time as my parents. Yeah. yeah. I, I yeah. Want, my dad actually he hit me up. He was like, yo, I got an idea for the podcast because I've been trying <laughs> to get him on for a while. Yeah. And he wanted to talk about marriage okay. and because they're going That's, like 20. They have so days. much information yeah. to share know? with us and it's like not a it's not even that they're because there's 30 year relationships that are like toxic that they just kind of survive together but granted they, not every relationship uh, they, is yeah. perfect and but. they don't they're not they might not have necessarily started so hot but they were able to provide an environment for us to not be so toxic in our relationships and they kind of at least gave us that foundation yeah the foundation. they gave us a foundation and to get even if you're not that happy like to get to 25, 30 years, is, that's a... A companionship? Yeah. A hundred percent. And I think that you can definitely learn a lot from, okay, how am I, How do I build this friendship? Mm-hmm. Or um, how did things start? Or like, what is important to keep a marriage yeah. alive? And what is important to share with your kids? Um, yeah. There's just so much knowledge How do you deal have. with this person for multiple decades mm-hmm. <laughs> in the same bed as you? Yeah. And you want to have... Yeah. Because you change so much. I mean, just yeah. now with the last 10 years, I've changed in so many different ways. I'm like, yeah. I can't imagine being with a partner for 30 Would years. Would you say they've like changed much- a little bit since you guys have gotten older? I don't know. It's hard because I just started realizing that, that they're people too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I, like, I, you are a person. <laughs> I didn't know that. that yeah, you were, you were a baby. You That's a baby. really bad, right? But it's it, no, it's more like I always thought of them as like, 
I looked up to them. I was mm-hmm. thankful for the, them building the home that we had. I was thankful for them providing for us. I was thankful for the guidance that they that they gave and just who they were. Um, I think for us in our family structure, for a lot of the time, our parents were like the idols because everything yeah. was perfect. And then things happened with our family that weren't so Started perfect. Out, yeah. um, and so that kind of breaks your trust with your parents too. Um, and now it's like i want to rebuild that exactly yeah. again and how can we move forward but uh, again the moving forward you need to acknowledge some of the stuff that happened and yeah. so it's like trying to get to that smooth yeah. that over has been a yeah. hurdle you know i, I found out some some stuff about my parents and i'm like when did this happen right like this was mm-hmm. happening during my lifetime and i'm like what, what? right <laughs> like you trying to pe- put the pieces together yeah. like when was this okay this mm-hmm. happened what yeah. You know? and, and especially when you have so much time on your own. So I just moved out of my parents' house last year. So I moved, I, when I was in college, I was away for four years and that was great, but it was a bubble, right? I didn't yeah. experience the real You're world. School, yeah. I was just worried about school. I was just worried about my friends. And then I moved back in with my parents, which was really tough. That it was, must have been, it yeah. was the toughest, however many years of mm. my life. It was only like two years. Girl. <laughs> it really wasn't that bad, but it, it just felt so like I was free and then I wasn't free. Yeah. And then it's it kind of worse because now you know what it's like to be free. Exactly. Yeah. And so I had to really have these conversations with my parents like, hey, I'm an adult. I can do what like not whatever I want. I will t- I will try to communicate as best as I can with you. But you can't dictate my what I decisions yeah. that I make. And I think that's really that was really important for me. I'm a very independent person. I don't want people telling me what to do. And I've hated that for all my life. That's mm. what has happened. And so as you get older, I, I think I, I came to realize, one, um, that how do I make decisions? Um, what kind of decisions that am, am I going to make? And am I comfortable with the consequences of those mm. decisions? I wasn't able to make those decisions before, so I didn't know what those consequences were. And kind of going back to the idea that my my parents are real people, yeah. I think it's, it's like I after living with them, after living, moving out, I just saw... A lot, I, I spend a lot of time with myself and what it is that makes me tick and what it is that is good about me, what it is that is not so good about me. And I realize where it's coming from in my family, too. Like, mm-hmm. why yeah, I am the way from, that I yeah. am. And that's when I was like, oh, my parents aren't pet perfect. Yeah. I have trust mm-hmm. issues. I get i've gotten cheated on why um all of these things are because of the the relationships that i have or have not had with my parents Mm -hmm. and so realizing that i would love to sit down and be like hey parents i love you i appreciate you but you did x y and z and i'm still learning how to cope with it but anytime again going back to this idea that if you bring it up to them they're gonna hate you for it all of those mm. things are tough and you can't get over something that you can't talk about. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, so. I definitely know where you're coming from. And yeah. I see, um, I would say my parents are a little more accepting. Cause again, my sister has been trying to have this. My sister's very, uh, she's very offensive when it comes to this kind of stuff. She's been like kind of, what drooling. do you mean by that? As far as like, she's really been dr- like really trying to get them to understand the what the, the I guess the negative aspects of what they've caused the traumas that they've caused and also not just kind of like attacking them because that's the other thing is mm-hmm. that you can't make them feel terrible for mm-hmm. something they didn't know that they were doing exactly but kind of helping them identify what they did and maybe trying to figure out why they did it or where their traumas come from yeah that's so, that's a big one it's yeah. like our parents have trauma too yeah, and so their I, parents do exactly. like this this shit is linear like yeah so it's she's since she's been at it like you guys said like it takes a while but she's yeah. again she's been at it for yeah, a little while it. here and she because she was the type she left and never came back mm-hmm. <laughs> you know she after senior year of high school she was gone she went to to college and she I think that's kind of where I I saw that side of it and I didn't want to go that far also one reason is because i didn't have it as bad as she did but also Mm -hmm. i didn't want to i knew that i didn't have to struggle as much as she did so i went i went away for school for two years and granted my first two years were probably financially and physically a little more difficult but i still had the mental capacity to be like you know i can just go back home and she was kind of like i'm done that's not an option 
There, and there's more, like, there's more of a welcome back home for me, for her to be like, why were you gone for so long? Why mm-hmm. didn't you call? Mm-hmm. And my parents would hit me up. I, like, I only talked to them, like, once a month because I needed that space. We are the yeah. most ungrateful <laughs> younger <laughs> children. Yeah, yeah. They would be like, oh, you don't talk, you don't want to talk to me anymore. I, right. You know, oh, I'm yeah. guilt tripping. Hmm. Oh, you don't have a mom? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then after those two years, I came back home in the tra- when I was transferring and that uh transition but i had kind of the opposite experience where i felt um i felt like i could build i could start building that relationship with my parents because i started kind of just calling stuff out and i was a little personally closer to my mom so i could bring up these kind of weird or taboo conversations and kind of get her perspective on things with my dad it was a little weird but um once i started to i stayed with them after my my first two years and they kind of got to see that I was a more of a I was also a person like I wasn't just their baby I was a, a an adult and my sister kind of always drilling them and they had their experiences with her here and there and then the, I think the the pandemic is really when it came together for everyone because me and my sister both came back home for I think three or four months and we had those conversations regularly we kind of Again, she was the one that kind of... You were able to actually connect yeah, like you weren't yeah, able to when you were younger. Exactly. And she she's the one that brings up the conversation, and then I kind of come in. Because she can get a little heated. So mm-hmm. I come in, I'm like... Let me give you a break. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, you know... you got, Good cop, bad cop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, y'all aren't terrible. Hold right. on. <laughs> we might take that approach, actually. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so there's, there's just... It's crazy how there's so many different experiences within similar sets of families and settings it's Mm -hmm. i i think it's it's just there's a lot to be learned from from having that dialogue with people absolutely Mm -hmm. Ugh, parents family it's so that one and i had no idea that we were gonna start talking about parents (laughs) that's crazy that's a good conversation to have though yeah and there's so many layers like it's just layers upon layers of like who you are as a person there's the parents there's the friends there's the experiences that you have like without other people Mm -hmm. like with like individuals and so it's so interesting how we become who we become yeah so do you think i guess going back to how your parents are now as far as the the roles that they play in each other's lives you know the stereotypical you know mom does all the cooking and cleaning and and all that kind of stuff dad goes to work comes home and watches tv or whatever like that's you know that's what you experience yeah now. yeah so is there kind of like a a difference in the roles that they play with each other now or is it kind of the same Go well ahead. the thing is um initially so that was what was the case my mom was a stay-at-home mom me yeah. my sister were at school and stay then at home dinner. because i i i came i didn't know this when i was younger that she worked she worked well, they have, yeah, yeah, yeah they have she, their side gigs. She had some side <laughs> she, stuff. She had right. to work, yeah. Right, yeah, she did work for, like, a newspaper and stuff like that, did, um, tried to get advertising for it, but it, in general, like, for the most part. It was the housework, yeah. Right, housework and stuff like that, and then my dad was at work, and then once we kind of started growing a little bit older, at the end of high school, towards my beginning of college, my mom did start to go for her master's. And so, oh, okay. Yeah, so she has a master's in family therapy now, Ooh. and so, like, now at this point, which is, you know, we're, like, I 10 should, years yeah, ahead, yeah. she's working, you know, same as my dad and stuff like that, and so they're both kind of the mm. breadwinners, and you know, mm-hmm. assisting each other and caretaking. There were caretakers for my um, caregivers for my, you know, my grandfather who passed away about a year ago. And then now they're caregivers for my grandmother um, who's living with them now. And so, like, the dynamic's a little different. Like, they don't have the kids in the home anymore, but yeah. they're still kind of taking care of, you know, Somebody, people yeah. and things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I would say that at the end of the day, it still falls on my mom to do a lot of the household mm-hmm. work. That's exactly um, what I was going to yeah. say. Um, one, another thing that's important about our family dynamic is that when we were younger, we lived in the DR, and my dad mm-hmm. left us, I think, maybe three or six years after we were born. Maybe mm-hmm. may, three. I want to say three-ish years. And he would come back and forth every couple of months. And so my mom was taking care of us for everything. the majority. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Our childhood. That's that was, what I remember my mom being that person. Yeah. Whereas my dad wasn't. Like, we would call him, we would talk to him, but it wasn't, like, really there. Yeah. And I'm sure that that affected his relationship with us. Um, And then when we got back to the U.S., then that's when my mom didn't have work for the longest. Yeah. Because she, her degree doesn't count, right? Yeah. No one degrees count. My dad's a contractor. And so he had to do a lot of that work. And, again, yeah, 
I think my mom still now, even though she um, got her degree, she has two jobs. Mm. And so even though she has two mm. jobs. My mom got two jobs. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying. No, but yeah, yeah. yeah. I was making she's, like, no, no, no. She's, yeah. she's getting her own stuff now. Like yeah. she finally feels like she can and obviously that was because of certain circumstances that happened between my dad and my and my mom but i think it's important to note that she works from 8 a.m to 8 p.m mm-hmm. and then she still has to cook she still has to clean yeah my dad does some of that stuff every when he years, wants to you know? when he wants yeah to. <laughs> like exactly when he wants to which like i appreciate that he is able to to provide for her in other ways mm. that we probably don't see but i sometimes it's hard to you know you want that balance yeah. you yeah and also us too i think it's it's hard being women knowing that you are expected to support that as yeah. well but also wanting to not be that like i never ever want to cook a queen for a man i want him to do that shit mm. for me yeah but so. you've done that also i definitely have relationships, yeah, yeah. because right? so that's yeah. what i know no. But then after I did that and I realized that like that's this, never who I wanted to be. Being a pick me will not get you far. Exactly. Yeah, but I, I, I think that <laughs> you know? the reason that you don't want that is because you feel like that's your only option. Or at least you did when you were growing up. Not necessarily. I think the reason why I don't want that is because I growing up it was so imbalanced mm-hmm. right we only as be, being us women we saw all that my mom had to deal with yeah. on her own yeah that's what i mean yeah. yeah 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 and so like now i'm like i don't it, i don't see that as my only option but i also i just want balance i yeah. want i want my man to like if i'm if i'm coming home late 50 50 exactly yeah, yeah. i want him to cook for me mm-hmm. i want him to like know that i love my job just as much as he does mm-hmm. and if i want to stay working important. exactly if i want to stay working and i want to have a child he's going to be the one taking care of it if that's what's going to happen yeah. maybe the next child will tw- switch roles i want it to be a conversation and a l- changing the conversation a little bit but adding to that my one of my friends we had a lot of conversations about what relationships really need to be and sometimes i think we are so used to the gender norms and the social norms mm-hmm. of what women and what men need to have and i think it's important to know that everyone is different yeah. and everyone has different wants different needs different aspirations and it should be a conversation you should never just be oh you're my girlfriend you're my boyfriend i am expecting you to do this or you're my yeah. wife mm-hmm. you're my husband i'm expecting you to do this it's it's a contract. It's a social yeah. contract where two people need to decide on who's going to do what. Exactly. Yeah. And it needs to be mutual. Yeah. I think recently I've been saying a lot that relationships are things that you kind of, you create them step by step. Like you mm-hmm. can't just come in thinking this is what's going to happen and this is what's going to happen. It's like we have to build it from the ground up. Um, and I don't think a lot of people do that. No, um, you just kind of go. Yeah, it's kind of like, oh, this- you're my girlfriend. Now you can't talk to no boys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, God, just, it's annoying. Uh, yeah, and I think it, I think it kind of plays into the role of the power dynamic yeah. too in the yeah. relationship because um, I get a lot of what I'm going through now is because I live with my sister, mm-hmm. so now she's kind of like the breadwinner in our in our relationship as siblings, where you know I'm taking out the trash, but I always being the boy in the family, I always took out the trash anyways. But now I'm like I'm doing the dishes. And I'm, I'm like the stay-at-home brother, you know? Mm. And, and, you know, so I'm I'm doing, like, the side work. And she still cooks and stuff because she likes doing her own thing. Right. But at the same time, I'm kind of learning. I never had that kind of rigid, my wife has to do everything for me. Because my I also saw the working aspect of my mom because I spent most of the time, most of my time growing up with her. So I saw her, like, she took me to work. I saw her doing work at home. And my dad was always kind of, he was still the, the breadwinner, but... I also saw him doing yard work. I saw him, uh, sometimes he would do the dishes for my mom. So he would barbecue and stuff sometimes. The barbecue, yeah, man. The bar- the <laughs> yeah, barbecue. exactly. So it, it's kind of, there was a little more balance, but it's still kind of expected traditionally for the woman to, to stay home and do all the work. And then I was like, that's hella work. <laughs> like be, so see, having that perspective of being so with my mom all the time. I'm like, like it's how not does only she... the house, it's the kids yeah. too. And like, how is she supposed to do her own thing? What? So I, she doesn't have a life yeah, period. Exactly. Is she, that's one of the things that my mom always, she didn't like throw it in her face, but it was something that she always said. She was like, you are my life. Like mm-hmm. I sacrificed yeah. for you Literally, to have whatever life. you wanted. And she's like, she says that she, she wanted to do it, but sometimes I'm like, did you really want to just yeah. be like, not just cause 
it's a it's a lot of work it's amazing work that you're doing and you raised us amazing and i'm so appreciative of that but at the same time is that all you wanted for yourself Mm. i know how how smart you are i know how capable you are why why is it that you're lowered to just a mom Mm -hmm. or a housewife and it's because of that kind of expectation to as a little girl growing up in dr she learned how to cook and clean and take care of a man Mm -hmm. and one thing one thing that literally bothers i say that all the time still but it still bothers me to say it's when you when a a woman like cooks really well they're like oh yeah or or or, oh yeah and i'm like really like that's not what i'm doing i want to just feed myself because it's just good Mm -hmm. now there's kind of in my experience is kind of switching up equalizing a little bit with me because i i i can cook so, like, I'll cook, and my mom will be like, ah, you're going to be a good husband. No. I'm like, all right, all right. I'm like, all right, all right. I'm like wait a minute, that's wait a funny. minute. Stop playing games. See, that's <laughs> cool. Yo, as soon as you're done with the school, they're like, where are the kids at? Where's yeah. the marriage? Where is it at? Where is yeah. it? Let's go. If it's not education, it's going to be your relationship. Family, yeah. 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 So, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> so um we're kind of you know we're getting to that time a little bit yeah uh do you guys have anything that you'd like to to put out there any closing remarks anything that you need people to know mm. people to know i have people to shout out if that's okay. what you yeah, you yeah. want me to do now yeah go ahead yeah so i love supporting all of my friends my family who do really amazing work um i have two cousins one of them lives in utah and the other one is currently in utah. south korea very oh, weird what? right all of these great places um so my cousin um she um owns uh I guess an ice ice cream shop um, or an ice cream. She, she sells them from her house. Um, mm. If you look at her on Instagram, it's SLC Fatso. So Salt Lake City Fatso. Mm. Um, and she makes really great homemade ice cream. Absolutely. I feel love like her ice stuff. cream from Utah would be fire. It would be amazing. I'm just waiting for her to be able to ship it out mm. um, because I literally went there for Thanksgiving in yeah. order to, to pur- purchase that. <laughs> and then... I'm going to just open up my Instagram so I can make sure to say their Instagram handles. All right. My other cousin's name is Loso F. Perez, and you can look him up at L.O.S. Comic. Um, and he's a really wonderful artist, and he has a wonderful wife um, who also does comics and, and books. And um, love Oh, her. they do like, like comic comics. Comics, yeah. like oh. legitimate comics. comics. Oh, he's snap. an artist. He got an MFA, and he's teaching English right now in South Korea. Um, oh. So very, very impressed and very, very happy. And then I have two sorority sisters who are businesswomen, mm. um, black-owned businesses, um, Latina-owned businesses, which I would love to shout, shout out. She, this line sister made my 25th birthday cake and i loved oh, it yeah the literally cakes, the cakes. Is, is she dominican yeah, she's dominican yeah, the mm-hmm. cakes. um <laughs> <laughs> it was really really good and it was just artistry on artistry so if you are in hackensack new jersey and you want a cake made or cupcakes made she makes both spiked and virgin treats mm-hmm. um um you can follow her at crowned confections so at crowned underscore confections and you can find her instagram and you can see all of her stuff um and then the last one I love Wait, li- I didn't know you could make spiked confections. Yes. So basically I, she makes cupcakes. Um so I ordered both of them. I ordered a, a plain cake that was virgin, mm. but I also made cupcakes that were pineapple and so she put a little shot of rum in oh. it. So it, she puts she spikes it that way. Wow. And you can do spiked strawberries as well. She she did has a whole Dang, situation. I didn't know that. Wow. Mm-hmm. I'm so if you want a little boozy, boozy sweet <laughs> something, she could do that for you. And then my last line sister I, I hope they get so much business from this. I'm telling you. Um, it's super sweet, uh, super sweets, and they do the liver. Um, so not just in Philadelphia, I believe, but in other places. So it's super set sweets. So super set underscore sweets. So super set is together. Okay, I guess so, so bakeries, yeah. um, ice cream, and comics. Yeah, love we, su- these we support we we support small businesses. I here, love right? them. Mm-hmm. It's, they're they're foundation to society. Yeah, I'm very very happy for all of them and what they're doing. 
No, that's wonderful. Um, I guess for me, I don't have that many people to shout out. Um, but on my own Instagram, forever at Forever mm. Cami, Cami with a Y, um, I do book reviews. So I've been since I finished school, I've been trying to read as much as possible mm. for fun, which I hadn't really done before college and yeah. since before college. And so it's been really fun to get into the hobby. And so I've been getting into it, um, and that's been really fun. And then just in general, I guess closing remarks: uh, protect Black women. Mm -hmm. protect black trans women um all of that stuff yeah but thank you for having us of course yeah. thank you guys for coming on you know yeah. this, Wonderful is, uh, host. this conversation really went somewhere yeah i think that's super important yeah so, it was so much deeper than what i expected yeah, it to yeah. go to but i really <laughs> i really appreciate it it's an opportunity to share who we are and also to just yeah. see how even though we're all dominican we all had different experiences yeah super different that's great mm -hmm. that's crazy that's the thing i'm starting to learn too because i had um uh, my sister and her friend Jenny on, and even within that dynamic, we had totally different experiences. So that's pretty. It's pretty cool to kind of hear people's stories, and you know, mm -hmm. that's part of why why I started this, so I can see, kind of learn and gain perspectives, and be able to to give you guys a platform to be able to show people how different everyone can really be, even within the same household. Yeah. yeah, and I listened to your last podcast, <laughs> and you said that you weren't an artistic person, oh my but I think that you are, and I think you're doing amazing work, no. so definitely keep Thank it up. You. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank appreciate you for that. giving us the space yeah. to talk about our work, our families, our identities, and just mm. life in general, too. Yeah, of course. Especially um, in quarantine, very, we very all necessary. need a little bit yeah. of great conversations and great connections. Need some yeah. human, human connection. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Totally. Well, this has been another episode of The Sandbar. Uh, I'm going to tag all the small businesses in the, the I'm going to put it in the description and I'm going to put it on the YouTube. I'm going to tag Cami. You guys check out her book reviews and just kind of, you know, watch out for some more content. You know, that's uh, if you have something to add to the conversation, I'm sure this is going to be a very compelling conversation for certain people. Definitely let us know.